Welcome to the uh, 2020 Patient Information Day. This year it's going to be slightly different in that we're doing it on Zoom and I thought I'd kick this up the Information Day off by with a quick presentation covering some um, key points that have come up on the Facebook group uh, and key questions that patients uh, are asking. I'm also going to signpost you to the videos we have on our YouTube channel which cover the topics that were discussed at the last two patient information days and our lab open day in Leicester. A subject that not surprisingly is coming up very often is advice around coronavirus and um, as you will have seen on my Facebook postings I strongly recommend that if you do have any questions, you look at the Kidney Care UK website, which has lots of really useful information and is regularly updated. And in our question and answer session after the break, we're going to be joined by Professor Martin Wazelka, a consultant in infectious diseases, who will be able to deal with any specific questions you have around coronavirus. One commonly asked question is, can I pass IGA nephropathy to my children? And uh, I want to signpost you to a talk by Danny Gale, which deals with the genetics behind IGA nephropathy. And he gave this talk at our Patient Information Day in London a couple of years ago. The, bot the short answer is IGA nephropathy very rarely runs in families. And so for most patients with IGA nephropathy, it is very unlikely that you will pass it to your children. Uh, if you do have any specific questions about this, then please speak to your nephrologist who will know more about your family history uh, and, its, uh, and the likelihood of there being kidney disease that runs in the family. We also are, are joined on this uh, information day by Louise Oney, who is a paediatric nephrologist with a special interest in IgA vasculitis and IgA nephropathy. And she's going to talk to us about IgA nephropathy in children and give a paediatric perspective to um, to all the questions that you might have about IgA nephropathy. There are also a number of questions regarding kidney transplantation and uh, we're going to be joined by a one of our transplant nephrologists from Leicester, Dr Peter Topham, in the question and answer session to deal specifically with transplant related questions. I think if you do have a kidney transplant then you're in very good company and I've just put up on the screen here a few famous people who within the last uh, few years have received a kidney transplant. So you have Selena Gomez, Andy Cole, Stevie Wonder, all of whom had transplants not for IGA nephropathy. And then you have Don Jones, who was an all-star NFL player who played for most of his career with IGA nephropathy and came to the Manchester Patient Information Day and gave a really great talk about what it's like to be an elite athlete and have kidney disease. And if you're interested, he's written a book about his experiences, which I would thoroughly recommend uh, in terms of uh, how he lived with the disease, what it did, what it meant to him, and how he overcame IgA nephropathy to continue as a sportsman and to eventually get a kidney transplant from his dad. So I also want to um, signpost you to two really useful talks on kidney transplantation. One from the Information Day in London and one from the Information Day last year in Glasgow. And these provide a lot of good general in background information about kidney transplantation and specific issues related to IgA nephropathy. So please take a look if this is something that you're particularly interested in. We've also had a number of questions regarding pregnancy and IgA nephropathy, which we will deal with in the question and answer session. But I would point you to this uh, presentation from Craig Brabham uh, at our Kid Patient Information Day in London. Uh, it's a really good presentation that covers all the key areas around pregnancy and trying to get pregnant if you have IgA nephropathy. And Kate is one of the world's leading experts on pregnancy and kidney disease. A consistent theme that came up when we looked at posts on the Facebook page was uh, patients were really wanting an explanation for the jargon and the technical terms that nephrologists use without really thinking when they talk to you about your kidney disease. And um, this was another theme that really came up when we um, analysed all the postings that we could find in so on social media with patients talking to each other about their IgA nephropathy. And if you're interested in how we looked at the 
um, social media posts, please take a look at Tom Oates' talk, uh, which is on the YouTube channel from our London Information Day, where he talks about how we can use social media to improve patient care. And as a result of the, this work that we did, we've generated a series of short videos really addressing the common issues that patients have raised uh, when talking to one another on social media. One of these is around communication, and you can see here that myself and Dr. Matt Graham Brown, who's one of our trainees in Leicester, go through the common terminology and jargon that we that are used when we talk to patients with kidney disease and explain what each of those terms means. Uh, and one of the things that came up recently was what is the difference between IgA nephropathy and FSGS and I thought I might just go into a little bit of detail here to explain that. So to make a diagnosis of IgA nephropathy or FSGS you need to have a kidney biopsy and here you can see what the kidney biopsy looks like. Um, once we've taken it it's a very small thin core of tissue that we look at under the microscope. So this is what the kidney looks like under the microscope. And what you can see here are those round structures, which are the glomeruli, or the filters of the kidneys. And each kidney has a million of those uh, when you're healthy. And as you lose kidney function, you lose the number of glomeruli. In IgA nephropathy, those filters are filled up with the protein IgA, which you can see here glowing green. Uh, in the kidney biopsy and you can make out those circular structures scattered through the kidney biopsy and every single one of those is full of IgA protein that is deposited within the filters and is starting to cause kidney damage. And so in terms of terminology any disease that affects these fine filters and causes inflammation is called a glomerulonephritis. And IgA nephropathy is one type of glomerulonephritis, and FSGS, or focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis, is a different type of glomerulonephritis. To diagnose both types of disease, we need the kidney biopsy, and under the microscope, these two diseases look very different. So on the left hand side is a normal filter, in the middle is a kidney biopsy from someone with FSGS and what you can see here is that there's a big red area which is essentially scar tissue and so the scar tissue occupying half the glomerulus and the other half looks reasonably normal and then on the far right you have a glomerulus in IgA nephropathy which looks different again and what you can see is there's lots of those black dots which are nuclei for cells and so there are lots of cells in this glomerulus which is very different and so when we do the kidney biopsy we can very clearly tell the difference between the two diseases. What's more is that clinically patients are behave very differently with the two diseases. In FSGS patients are much more likely to have very very severe swelling. It's most, it commonly can affect children where often it is genetic in origin and globally it is a disease that we are much more likely to see in patients of African descent. By contrast, IgA nephropathy is rare in people of African descent. It's unusual in children and we have yet to find clear evidence for specific single genes being involved in the development of IgA nephropathy. What's more, we really don't see the level of leg swelling in IgA nephropathy that we see in FSGS. And FSGS is often associated with something called the nephrotic syndrome, which is where there is so much leakage of protein in the urine that the blood level of protein falls, and that is associated with severe swelling. Now, while these diseases are very different, there are in fact two clinical trials using the same drug to treat IgA nephropathy and FSGS. And these are the duplex and the PROTECT studies, which are testing to see whether a drug called Sparsentan will be useful in both of these forms of glomerular disease. And this is because this drug works on basic mechanisms within the kidney that are common to both FSGS and IgA nephropathy. And some of you may be in the PROTECT study, and we will hopefully have an answer as to whether Sparsentan is useful in IgA nephropathy by the beginning of next year. A very common question that I'm asked 
is, is there a relationship between the gut and developing IgA nephropathy? Well, there certainly is evidence from genetic studies that those genes important in maintaining a healthy gut are also important in IgA nephropathy. We know that the IgA nephropathy we can see depositing in the kidneys is very similar to the IgA that is produced by the gut and by other mucosal sites such as the lining of the lungs and the lining of the genital urinary tract. And we also know that a small number of people with abnormalities of their gut, so inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, and celiac disease also develop IgA nephropathy. And in the laboratory, we have some very early information that the bacteria that live in your gut may well be important in causing the body to generate the IgA that ultimately ends up in the kidneys. And so when we put all of this information together, there does seem to be a strong argument that changes in the gut could very well be linked to development of the kidney disease, IgA nephropathy. But I think it's really important to understand that just because you have IgA nephropathy does not mean you are going to develop a disease of your gut. And equally, if you have inflammatory bowel disease or celiac disease, this does not mean you are going to develop IgA nephropathy. It is much a rarity for the two diseases to be linked together. And so while it is an association when we look at thousands and thousands of people, it, there isn't a direct causal relationship between the bowel disease and IgA nephropathy. What's more is there is no evidence to suggest that a specific diet will improve IgA nephropathy. My advice to patients is if they wish to become vegetarian or they want to try a gluten-free diet or become a vegan or try probiotics or prebiotics then by all means if they feel better on that particular diet great I'm not going to tell them to stop it but what I can't tell them is that this is going to alter the progression of their disease or make their disease easier to treat with conventional medications in terms of dietary modifications, we do recommend in IgA nephropathy, the most important is to restrict the amount of salt or sodium in the diet, because this will impact not only on your blood pressure control, but also on the amount of protein that you pass in the urine. And we'll hear more about that later. As I say, a good general diet for the general population is what we recommend in IgA nephropathy. And of course you can have alcohol, but please stick to the recommended adult limits, uh, which you can see here on the right. There are, of course, some caveats, and these particularly apply if you are on dialysis or you are close to needing dialysis with kidney function in the teens or single figures, so below 20, essentially. And here is where a renal dietitian is crucial in advising about your dietary intake. We just to point you to a couple of films that we have on the YouTube channel, one dealing with diet and the, and the other dealing with lifestyle um, in terms of exercise that will improve general health in IgA nephropathy. And as I say, diet is always a question that comes up when we talk about IgA nephropathy with patients. And as you can see in the picture below, we've, all, we've shot another video dealing specifically with diet. Uh, and this is uh, with Una Gooding, who's one of our dietitians in Leicester, and she'll be joining the expert panel after the break. Uh, and so if you have any specific diet-related questions, please put these to Una and she will answer them for you. And just to finish the gut story, we now actually have a therapy that is currently in clinical trials that specifically targets the immune system of the gut to try and turn off the production of the damaging IgA that we know deposits in the kidneys. And this is the Nefigard trial, which is testing the drug Neficon. And again, some of you may be in that study, and we hope to have provisional data available to tell us whether this is working in IgA nephropathy by the end of the year. So watch this space. Not surprisingly, the commonest asked questions by patients is, what treatments are available for my IgA nephropathy? 
and what treatments are likely to be available in the near future. And we have talks on the YouTube channel that deal with these in terms of uh, conventional therapies and, and drugs currently in clinical trials. And we've also generated two new videos, one dealing with treatment of IgA nephropathy here and now in 2020, and one dealing with potential alternative therapies that have been suggested in IgA that actually we don't think there's enough evidence to support their use. So please take a look at these videos when we're able, when we, when we upload them onto the YouTube channel. So what treatments do we know work in IgA nephropathy? Well, anyone who's heard me talk before will not be surprised to say the key strategy for treating IgA nephropathy is to control the blood pressure. And we can do this with drugs and we can do this with general lifestyle modification. And the keys to blood pressure control are regular exercise, being an ideal weight, reducing salt in the diet, and if needed, taking blood pressure reducing tablets. The blood pressure reducing tablets we know work best in IgA nephropathy are the ACE inhibitors or the angiotensin receptor blockers. And you can see here, the ACE inhibitors are drugs that end in pril, like ramipril and lisinopril. And the angiotensin receptor blockers or ARBs end in sartan, so drugs like losartan and candesartan. And we would hope that all patients with IgA nephropathy are on one of these drugs to the maximum dose that you can tolerate. It may be that you need additional tablets to control your blood pressure, and this is not uncommon, uh, but we would hope that the first tablet that would be tried would be an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. So are there drugs that can specifically treat IgA nephropathy and stop that IgA depositing within the fine filters of the kidney? Well, the answer is no at the moment, but the outlook is particularly promising as we have a number of new treatments being tested in clinical trials that may well be able to turn off inflammation in the kidneys and turn off the production of this IgA that sticks in the kidneys and causes all the damage that we worry about in IgA nephropathy. And hopefully we will start to get results from these trials towards the end of this year and the beginning of next year. So the future in IgA nephropathy is looking very promising for new therapies, both for patients with IgA nephropathy in their own kidneys and for patients who may well suffer from recurrent disease in their kidney transplant. So I'm going to finish there and leave you with the IgA team who work with me in Leicester on all aspects of IgA nephropathy. So thanks for listening and I look forward to hearing your questions uh, later on in the patient day.